Hello everyone and welcome. Today's webinar is being recorded and you will receive a follow-up email to view the recording within 24 hours. If you have any questions, please submit them using the question section of the control panel. We will cover as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. Now, I'd like to introduce Peter McKee from Docker and Jim Armstrong from Sneak. Hello everybody. This is Peter McKee from Docker speaking. I am on the developer relations team. Glad to have you here. I wanted to see if some, uh, we got a bunch of people on the call, but before we kind of kick off, it'd be great if, uh, while maybe I'm talking a little bit, if you guys could throw where you're at, what part of the world you're at, maybe what city, or it'd um, be great to see where everybody's from. I'm in Austin, Texas, and uh, we have Jim Armstrong on the webinar with us from Sneak. Hey, Jim, can you uh, tell us a little, tell everybody about yourself. Yeah, yeah. So uh, great to uh, to have everybody here. I see loads of people still joining us, so this is it's exciting to see uh, folks interested in this topic. So um, as Peter said, I work for uh, for Sneak. Uh, I used to work uh, at Docker with with Peter, so really excited about um, this partnership and uh, getting to work with loads of uh, folks at Docker uh, again as we build these uh, these products together. Uh, and I'm based in Dallas, so just up the street a ways from from you there, Peter. Yeah, good old Texas. Got a couple uh, Texas boys on. We love. I like that D double <laughs> dynamic duo from uh, Texas. Maybe that's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm seeing we got people from uh, Gary's from Ohio, Toledo. I've been to Toledo. Uh, I took us here, Oregon. Yeah, in Oregon, London. Hey, Richard, Germany. Awesome. All right. All right. Oh, good. So let's. Let's get started here. Let's get going. So why integrate Docker and Sneak? So at Docker, we're really focused on developers and developer productivity, building tools and frameworks to help developers use containers and go from cloud, from code to cloud. Um, and one of the biggest requests we've been getting on the roadmap is uh, for security and scanning your images, container vulnerabilities. Um, just a quick note, quick shout out. If you, after uh, this call or now, if you have any features known, not only for security or anything just for Docker, head over to our roadmap, it's public. It's on GitHub. So if you get, go to github.com forward slash Docker forward slash roadmap, and, and I'll put that link in the in the chat. And uh, feel free to read through all the, all the issues and what's on our roadmap and add any features you would like to see. Also, um, Plus one, a lot of the uh, of features that are currently in there that you want to see um, bump to the top and us address quicker. But yeah, so security was one of the top highest uh, features that was being asked of Docker. So we partnered up with Sneak to help us deliver uh, some of those key features into the CLI. And um, so Jim is here. Jim's going to tell us a little bit more about Sneak and, and what they're all about. Yeah, I think you know the, the the common theme there is that developer focus. So Sneak is a security company, um, so that was one aspect certainly that's important here is having that that deep security information and having the security researchers. But the other aspect of it was that Sneak's DNA is on the developer side as well. We started with an open source security product to help people, you know, scan um, their open source dependencies and fix those, and then we added Sneak Container. Again, the idea is not just showing you a report of what vulnerabilities are in a container, but from a developer's perspective, how do you go about fixing those, those vulnerabilities? Because we have this report now, what do you do with that information? In fact, SNYK, S-N-Y-K stands for, so now you know, the idea there being, you get this report, so now you know, what do you do um, to actually take care of those vulnerabilities? Um, and particularly if you're a, a developer who maybe is not an operating system expert um, in getting into some of those details. Um, so, yeah, yeah, that was why we, that was why uh, I think both uh, both organizations wanted to uh, to partner up on this. Is that that developer first mindset? Yeah, for sure, for sure. And we had a webinar a couple of weeks ago where we kind of showed um, a preview of uh, scanning using the Docker CLI, um, and it really is as simple as Docker run. It's a Docker scan. And again, if you want to see more of that, we're we're going to go through some of those commands today. But if you want a little more in-depth um, webinar, we have one, we, Jim and I did one two or three weeks ago. It's posted up on our YouTube channel. Uh, so our YouTube channel is uh, youtube.com docker run, two R's. 
um, yeah, so go check it out. You can watch it uh, at your at your leisure up there. Yeah, a little little shout out for SneakCon next week too. So Justin yep. from Docker um, is uh, doing a presentation with Danielle, who's one of our product managers. Uh, and again, they're going to be showing next week uh, at SneakCon, which is free for everybody to attend. Uh, but you can see them do a deep dive on uh, on that uh, on the Docker uh, desktop and Docker Hub as well. Um, so lots of great stuff coming next week too. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, and so this phase that we wanted to, to show everybody today was Sneak integrated into Docker Hub. And uh, we're going to go into the details in a minute, but we've made scanning your image was, with Hub as simple as Docker Push. So once Sneak is, uh, scanning is enabled in Hub, you can do a Docker Push on your image, and it'll be scanned in Hub, and you'll be able to see your results. Let me, let me jump over to Hub real quick. Let me show some of that. Let me log in. Where's my mouse? There it is. And I'm going to go to my favorite organization called Stark Technologies. And the way, let me let me kind of set up the way kind of Stark Technologies works, and it'll play into a little bit later as we go through some scenarios. But we have two major teams, hypothetically speaking, that we have a DevOps team that manages some of our internal base images. So if you look, if you see here, so we have a Node image, we have a Mongo image, and we have an MGINX image. These are all maintained by that DevOps team. They're in charge of making sure these are, uh, has the all the tools that our developer needs, let's say for a Node engineers. They have, they have the Node tools uh, that they need, and anything else they kind of need to do their job. And the DevOps team handles these images and pushes to them, updates them, those type of things. And then we have the development teams that are in charge of our application images. So you'll see uh, target tracking and a heads up display. Uh, this is the real code that's run inside the, the Iron Man suit. It's not, just kidding. Um, so anyways, so the development team is in charge of building the application images. And the way you do that in Hub, there's various different ways, but the way we do it is you come over here to organizations, and I'll come in to Stark Technologies, and there's a Teams tab. So you're able to create teams, and then once you have teams, you're able to add people to them, so you can add a member. But what I wanted to show you here is we're looking at the development team. Once you set up your teams, then you can assign permissions to repositories. So as you can see here, let me make this a little bit bigger for folks. So down here at the bottom, you can see target tracking, which is our application for target tracking. And again, you can see the team name is up here, development. And we've they have admin rights to that image. And you can see what admin rights, what uh, privileges you get with admin. So you can pull, push, view, edit, delete a repository. You can edit this build settings. Uh, you can update this description. Basically, you can manage that whole repository. Then if you look at the heads up display, they only have read write, and the reason I put read write there is I just wanted to be able to show the the other uh, uh, privileges you have with read write. So you have pull, push, and you can view the repository, and you can trigger builds. You can view the builds, cancel builds, those type of things. So our development team only has access to the images that they use, that they work on. Uh, not not just use, I'm sorry, because they will use the base images, but the, the main images that they're in charge of that houses their application code. And so let's go back to the teams. And same thing, we have a DevOps team. If we take a look at their permissions, as you can see earlier that I said, the Node, the Nginx, and Mongo, they have admin rights. They're gonna control those images. They're gonna update those images. They're gonna make sure that they're the best images for the development teams to use. So that's how we're set up here at Stark Technologies. Let me jump back to repositories. So we're taking a look at the repositories. You can see the list here. You can see some of them have scanning turned on no, uh, by this little scanned label here. And then you can see others that are not turned on yet, so not being scanned. So let's take a look at Mongo here real quick. So this is just the general tab. And you can see right here it says vulnerability scanning is disabled. So we want, if you wanted to enable scanning for your repositories, you come into that repository's details screen. You could click on enable here or you can come up to settings, click on settings. Let me go back real quick. Enable takes you to the takes you to settings. It's a quick shortcut. 
And then you can see here, we can enable image scanning. So there we go, we have scanning on. And now next time we push, uh, do a push into that repository, the scanning will kick off and show you the results. Let's jump in here real quick. So now that we have scanning turned on for all of our images, um, we could take a look at the, the base image and take a look at its vulnerabilities. So we could see, oh, we got a bunch of vulnerabilities. So before we do that, before we start taking a look at detailed vulnerabilities, how you um, how you fix those vulnerabilities, those type of things in the two different roles. So as a developer or as a DevOps, let me jump back to my slides. Let me kind of just walk you through a couple scenarios. So two main scenarios that, that we see out there in the wild, uh, and, th and there's variations of these, but these are the two main scenarios. So this first scenario we're looking at is the developer scenario. Your development team owns all your images, owns building, uh, writing code, building the images, pushing them in the hub, and getting them into production, right? So either through a CI, CD, you know, something like that, or manually. And so they start out, they're making changes, writing code, they're gonna build their container image locally, and then they're gonna do a Docker scan. And we're gonna take a look at this in a minute. But they're gonna scan the image, they're gonna um, fix issues, and then finally they're gonna push that image up the hub, and the scan will run again. So that's one scenario where you have uh, a development team owns end-to-end, -end. they own the application code, they own the base images. The second scenario is a little bit more comp uh, complex, not super complex, but we see this a lot. A lot of, uh, a lot of Sneaks customers um, have this scenario, and a lot of our developers also. So, and this is really around the teams, and I think this is where uh, Hub really comes into play. It allows uh, team members not to, not to, every time they wanna see uh, security vulnerabilities, you know, they would have to scan the image locally to see all the vulnerabilities. Now they could just go in the hub. But so two main roles in this kind of workflow, and we're gonna call it a DevOps lead. It, it, it could be a, you know, that don't get too hung up on the title, of course. Um, you know, it could be a, a team within the security team that handles all the base images. But that DevOps team is in charge of just that, all the base images. And you can see right here, they select the appropriate base image based on language, framework, and what tools you need. Um, and then they're gonna add those tools in, they're gonna remove stuff out of the image that doesn't need to be there. And then they're gonna scan, make sure the image is fine, they're gonna fix any vulnerabilities. And if everything's good, they're gonna push up into Hub and they're gonna slack the dev team, right? And say, you're good to go. Um, and depending on how you're using uh, tagging, right? The developers will always uh, know when, you, when there's a new tag and which tag to use and those type of things. And then the other side, of, on this right side of the screen, is the developer. And it's the same kind of scenario I talked about before, but you're, the developer's only worried about their application code. So they're gonna select the, the appropriate base image based on uh, the DevOps lead has created. And then they're gonna add in their custom tools and application packages. And then they're gonna run locally and scan that image. And they're only gonna be really concerned about what images have they, what vulnerabilities have they added into the image, right? And they're gonna fix those. Once those are all fixed, then they'll push the hub uh, and kick off their CI CD. So those are the two main scenarios. Um, let's go back into hub where, there we go. Uh, let me pause there for a minute. Let me, let me, I've been speaking a lot. Let me, Jim, do you have any color to, to add to that? Yeah. Sorry, I've just been, just been rolling through that. Yeah, no worries. I think um, I think no, I think you did a good job of sort of setting up the scenarios. I think the the idea there is, you know, in one one instance, you may be just responsible for everything. You may have the freedom to choose whatever base images you want and just add anything you want. And, but you're responsible for the security of the the entire container. Uh, in in a lot of shops, what we see is people get to this idea of we want to have kind of our core set of of base images that we we build things off of. That way it's not just the wild west. We, we have some idea of what's gonna be running uh, later on uh, in production. And so there's there's there are some people, generally a smaller set of people who are responsible for maintaining that. And then as a developer for the application end of things, you really only need to worry about the things you add on top of that container. So containers are built in layers, right? And it's just sort of dividing the responsibilities up 
based on who's responsible for those different um, those different layers. So that's very common as well. In fact, we see customers who go even further. There's like three teams, right? So now we got a base, we've got middleware, we've got the actual application code. It can get as complex as you want it, I suspect. I suspect, but you know, getting it to two is general enough, I think, to apply to a lot of situations. But yeah, extremely, um, extremely common. Cool, cool. Thank you. Okay, so I'm back here in Hub. And again, let me let me go back onto the main page. So I'm here on my repositories page. And let's take a look at this node. The the application we're going to be talking today is written in Node. So I'm Node as a developer is my the Stark Technologies Node image is my base image that I'm going to be using. So in this first scenario, we kind of we want to focus today more on that team, right? You have a DevOps uh, team that's managing the base images, and then you have developers managing application code. Again, if uh, you want to learn more about just the dev and handling everything, the the scenarios and the remediation kind of steps that we're going to go through, you'll do for both, right? You'll do for your base images if you're creating one, and you'll do for your application code, or you might do them all together, right? So they're, they're definitely the same, but we're kind of split them up a little bit here to give kind of a more of a real world scenario. Um, so with that said, I'm looking at my node. I'm, I have my DevOps hat on now. I'm in charge of managing and maintaining this Stark Technologies node image that all of our 30,000 developers are going to use, right? And so I come in here and I can see, okay, it's scanned. Let's take a look. And I can say, oh, geez, I got a bunch of vulnerabilities, right? I got 237 high severity vulnerabilities. A couple ways you can get in to see the vulnerabilities is you click right here on the vulnerabilities and that'll take you into the vulnerabilities uh, screen directly. And here they are. Let me go back. Another way is if you're looking at your tags, you have your list of tags. And again, you can see vulnerabilities here or you can just go into the tag. So let's, I'm going to stick with 12.18.4. And, and then you need to click on the vulnerabilities tab. So you can see we got a bunch of stuff going on here. I'm, let me hit the high levels, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna use Jim as my security consultant specialist to help me work through fixing some of this stuff. So you can see I pushed it about an hour ago. I have 237 high uh, vulnerabilities, 229 medium, and 4,423 low. Jim, I know you're gonna help me out with that. Uh, and then you can see a total here of how many vulnerabilities. And then we scroll down a little bit. This is where you get a list of your vulnerabilities. They're ordered from high severity to medium to low. So if you wanted to see the low, you could jump all the way to the end, you know, standard kind of uh, table and, uh, you know, paging. So let me jump, let me jump back to the beginning. So let me, um, I see a bunch of them here, Jim. They're, this is yeah. This is making me nervous. Let me, let me, let me expand this and, oh, okay. So this is a dependency tree, it looks like. Yep. So I've got my bzip2. All right, what, what do I do here? What am I looking at, Jim? Yeah, so essentially what you're getting there is is the relation to, from a particular vulnerability, which might be in a, you know, a library buried seep, somewhere deep inside of, you know, something else you installed uh, and getting back up to the top level package. So this one is, you know, it's a, I can tell it's a Debian image. It's got deep package in there, which is, Part of the package management system there, but it is that being there introduced bzip, which is a dependency for dpackage, and so that's where the vulnerability in this case uh, comes from. Now, is that information all super necessary? Sometimes, um, you know, because as a developer, you want to, and, and as a DevOps team and as a security team, you know, it, it's sometimes useful to know what the package is although i don't know that you know most of us are going to spend time particularly with an image like this where you've got a thousand vulnerabilities or so we're not going to go through each one and try and figure out all of those uh, those details and we'll we'll take a look i know in, in the demo here in a second and how we can kind of get to a fix much quicker but what is relevant here is thinking about you know what does this vulnerability mean is this something is this something that should exist in this container at all particularly for production maybe it's okay in development like i would need a package manager in development because i probably am going to be installing some extra stuff into the container for testing and uh, you know building purposes and all that kind of stuff and i need package management to be able to do some of those things so that's great if this was a container going to production i might change that answer 
I might not want dpackage in there or any package manager for that matter, matter because why should people be installing new packages in a production container, right? So getting back to the high level tool that's causing this vulnerability, I think is really important um, when it comes to sort of making that contextual, um, that contextual analysis. Um, the other interesting thing here too, I'll point out, you notice there's a fixed end column and none of these um, have a, a fix available. And, and I do want to point out here, you know, the idea in this workflow is that you've got a team who's building the internal kind of base image. They're still going to Docker Hub and getting Node um, in this case, right? And Docker does a good job of maintaining those Node images. So the fact that there's a bunch of vulnerabilities here is 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 important to note. We'll talk about how to get that reduced very significantly. Um, but the other side of it is part of that maintenance that goes into this is making sure that anything that can be fixed does get fixed, right? That's one of the things I think people rely on Docker to do. It's why people use those official images from Docker because they know, you know, tomorrow if one of these vulnerabilities is fixed, there's going to be a new node base image. And the idea of this sort of split workflow inside an organization is that you've got one team who's just focused on that aspect of it. As soon as there's a new node image from Docker, I'm going to rebuild my internal node images, and then that's going to kick off a chain of you know, builds for uh, everything else that's dependent on that, um, that internal node uh, image that I've got. Um, so all of those details are important. If this were an older image or if it was an image that was not well maintained, you'd start to see that fixed column be, be filled up very quickly. Um, but if you're pulling things like Docker official images, you probably, you know, most of those things are going to be fixed pretty quickly. So, you know, well. I think I might, I think in the Mongo, take a look at my latest here and go into vulnerabilities. Nope. No, nope, I'm wrong. I thought I, I thought I saw it yesterday. Sorry. False alarm. Thought <laughs> I saw something, something fixed in. So coming back here, jump in. Okay. So perfect. So I'm going to go. I, I need to fix this, right? We got 4,000 vulnerabilities. And like Jim said, you know, not necessarily, you know, alarm, right? It's the, it's the quality of the, you know, the severity of the vulnerability and why it's there. And will you keep it in, into uh, later images? So let me jump, I'm going to jump back to my terminal. And I've pulled down the repo that we manage uh, the node base image in. I'm going to, all that's in there is a Docker file. All right, and so I have the image already. Um, so I'm going to scan that image, and I'm just going to do um, here at this point. I'm just going to run a, a basic scan um, just to see all the vulnerabilities. Uh, and but what I'm also going to do is you can add in the Docker file, so I can tell it, hey, while you're scanning this, look at my Docker file and and glean as much information from what I'm doing in my Docker file, and from what you see in the actual image. So I'm going to add that now. So I'm going to do Docker file. And then I'm going to give it the name of the image. So start technologies. And we are doing node 12.18.4. Let's go ahead and run that. So that's going to run. Uh, just a quick note on Docker scan. You can do a dash dash login. That will log you into uh, Sneaks engine their site you can log in with your docker id when you log into uh when you do that and log in you get more scans on the cli than just without logging in so i highly recommend do a dash dash login that'll open up a browser tab for you you can use your docker id free account and you'll get more scans monthly but so now it looks like it's querying the database uh, hopefully i went out earlier and, and um Kicked all my kids off my internet connection. Uh, <laughs> it's lunchtime. They were eating sandwiches, but I said if anybody gets on to play uh, Doom or anything, um, they're all grounded. But no. So, okay. <laughs> so there we go. Okay. What? Let me kick it over to you, Jim. Tell, tell me what I'm looking yep. at here. Yeah. So we got the vulnerability report again. The the same vulnerabilities that we saw in the in the hub UI are here. But as a you know now at the development end, right? I've got to fix this container. Um, and this is particularly we're talking about the first part of that workflow where we're going to adjust our internal base image. Um, and we're very interested in the base image that we inherited, which is a Docker official image. But in this case, you can see at the bottom there that base image has you know in and of itself it has 500 vulnerabilities in it, 53 of which 
are uh, are high severity. And so, um, you know, we we looked at when we were looking at the dependency tree. One of the things we were kind of discussing and philosophizing about is, do we need all of those packages in there? Well, there's there's like if you go to the Node repository on Hub, there's tons of actual images in there, right? And some are much thicker. The nice thing about those sort of fatter images is they probably have everything you could possibly want to build a node application. So they're gonna be very simple to use. The flip side of that is they're gonna light up vulnerabilities reports because there's just tons of libraries in there and there may be bunches of them that you don't you don't need and you never use and never touch. And so, you know, how do you determine which of those are important and which aren't? Um, I think it's a little bit easier if you start with a slimmer base image. And that's one of the, you know, the sort of the principles of building containers anyway, is to start with a slimmer base image. So what you see below that is recommendations that the sneak uh, container provide sneak container engine provides on how to get to those uh, you know better base images so we could go to node 14 13 you see that'll knock off a whopping three uh, <laughs> three vulnerabilities for us but even bigger than that we can go to the slimmer images right now the slimmer image we remove a bunch of development dependencies and we remove a bunch of extra packages that maybe you need, maybe you don't, right? That's how you get down to so so uh, so many uh, so fewer vulnerabilities. That's probably not English, but it's close enough. I'm um, following. Yeah, <laughs> um, but that's how you get that number so low. And the, you know, as a Node developer, then you may have to figure out, okay, well, I'm going to need to add some packages back so that I can actually you know build my dependencies and get my application to run. But if you think about the whole life cycle again, right? As a developer. You can pretty quickly figure out which packages you need. You can add those to the Docker file. You can, you know, in your development scenarios, you start thinking about multi-stage builds. Your development scenarios, you'll have all those packages there. You build your application. Then your final application, you can be very surgical about removing those. And you know exactly what you've added to the container. So when you do get vulnerability reports, you know, well, I added that because I had to. It's required for my dependencies or it's required for the way my node application is configured. Um, but when I get to production, I don't need them because I've already built everything. And when I get to that final, you know, that, that final stage of my multi-stage build, um, I can remove those things and I don't need them anymore. So I think by, you know, again, a bit philosophical here, but getting that slim image, A, it reduces the vulnerabilities. That's good from a security standpoint. But again, you're being very specific about what goes into that container. And that, again, not just having a small container is you know one of the one of the tenets of, of good practices for building containers but only putting things into the container that you need for your application is another one of those tenets and so if you start with a slim image you're going to be doing both of those things um, and so i think you know while those those thicker images may be easier to start with um, ultimately getting down to those slim images is much better um, so over time you know obviously even if we switch to the node 1413 buster slim there's going to be a change at some point tomorrow there may be a vulnerability that gets fixed and node 1413 buster slim tomorrow might be different and if we did this scan tomorrow it would show you oh by the way this image there's new a version of node 1413 buster slim and today it only has 50 vulnerabilities so if you rebuild you'll get down to 50. Um, so all that's tracked by the sneak uh, container engine as well awesome i'm going to scroll up a little bit see what we have in here here's all of our super high severities telling me introduced in the base image, all that good stuff. Okay, so I think, Jim, I'm gonna switch to use this Buster Slim. Okay, good. Because since it's, a, it's in, and my thinking is managing this base image, like you said, is I don't need, I don't need this big fat images here, 12, 18, four, and 14, three. Like you said, it's gonna have all kind of tools in there that I don't need. So let me hop over to the code. And so let's take a look at that Docker file. So I'm going to change my from. I'm going to use Buster Slim. Uh oh. I think you just said don't add anything back in. Hmm. Well, yeah. Probably should be yeah, doing that. Thing, right. I think it's okay when you're doing it because you have an explicit need to do so. <laughs> oh. um, but I think there's some good details when we do the vulnerability scan that come from that as well, right? Like if they're part of those, if those things were part of the base image, then what do you do? Like you, you've got to start you know and and sneak will help you kind of pick a better base image but they're they're baked into that base image if you're surgically adding them you can surgically remove them too so right right i might okay. i might argue whether you need curl and nano in them inside a container but um 
but nonetheless, <laughs> some right. people, people like those things. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, let's build my image again. I'm gonna do a Docker build. I'm gonna hit start technologies. Why did I pick such a long name? <laughs> um, and I'm gonna do no. Oh, I actually copied that. So we're gonna create our own base image based off a of node. And again, don't don't worry about too much uh, about my tagging. This is just the way I've chose to do it. Um, you know, if you have your own convention, feel free to use that. So I'm gonna uh, build this image. We're using Build Kit, so hopefully it'll be nice and quick here. And then after this builds, I'm gonna I'm gonna push that image up into Hub, and then we can take a look at the vulnerabilities again in Hub. All right, relatively quick. Uh, so I'm just gonna do a Docker push. There it goes. All right, ran. Come on, okay, there we go. Usually my uh, my upload speeds are definitely slower than my downloads. Okay, so let's hop over into Hub and take a look here. So um, let's go back in. Again, I'm just going back to show you the flow to how and to get to see the vulnerabilities. Uh, so here on my repository list, I'm gonna click on Node, Stark Technologies Node. And it's gonna go out and spin it away and it's getting results for us. Scroll down to the bottom. So it's scanning right now. So we'll give that a minute. But to get in to see the vulnerabilities, you can click again here on each one of the images, or you can go into uh, tags and see a list of your tags. You can filter. Um, you can then select stuff and you can delete them. Basic things in Hub. Yeah, I think you can see there too. Like again, going back to this idea of using a slim image, you can see hub showing the compressed size but even at that you can tell there's a vast difference in buster slim versus versus regular node um, yes the compressed size right and that's that again that relates to all the things that go into those images so uh, oh there's your scan results too there we go so now we have 46 now we're down to 216 that makes me my exam my anxiety has just dropped <laughs> massively um but again, same thing. Come in here. You can see all your, uh, you can see your scan results. You can tab through. Um, and then, like Jim was describing earlier, you can, you can, um, you know, figure out what you want to remove, what you don't want to remove. Here's Vim. Maybe we don't need Vim. Let's go all the way to the end here. See some of the lows. We're not too concerned about the lows. And you'll see here, it's nice. We only have 20, 20 pages now, not uh, 400. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so there's all your vulnerabilities. Again, just to recap real quickly, you see a dependency tree right here in the UI. So you can see, kind of track down, there's our curl. Um, track down uh, where this where this vulnerability is kind of getting introduced. Yep. Yeah, I think too, the, the, you know, the what we showed in a couple of weeks ago too, you can get that dependency tree from the command line as well. So, you know, if you're at the command line doing the actual sort of troubleshooting work, you, there's an option docker scan is dash dash dependency tree i think is what it is actually yep. um, that will uh, show you that same sort of tree view um, it's a little bit higher level so it draws out kind of a pretty tree of the packages themselves um, as opposed to the long list of vulnerabilities but again just helping you kind of figure out what's in that container what things might you want to think about removing from the container particularly as it moves towards as it moves towards production awesome Jim, I'm gonna add in exclude the base. Yep. We we can and the reason I'm doing that is um well I know that I put uh some editors into the base image. Um but exclude base will look at your Docker file and exclude exclude your base image. So in this case, the the buster slim. So yeah. it's only really going to focus on kind of what is in my Docker file, and yep. and the image, and the image. 
Yeah, and again, you know, kind of as we start to think about the second half of that workflow, right? If you have somebody who's, or a team whose responsibility it is, whether it's security or a DevOps team or whatever the case may be, their responsibility to maintain that base image, you as the developer, just responsible for the layers you add, what's in that base image that's vulnerable, not not up to you to fix, right? It's up to somebody else um, to handle those. So all you need to, to look at are the, the vulnerabilities that come from the things that you've added. Um, and so you get that uh, by doing the exclude base, right? And that's what you're seeing, what you're seeing there. Yeah, and, and you get the Docker file command, right? Which tells you, you know, in this case, it's a pretty simple Docker file, um, but you could have, you know, long lists of run commands at multiple places in a Docker file. And so getting, again, the dependencies are nice because you know exactly kind of what's in the container, but the Docker file is another good bit of information because it tells you where it came from, right? What step actually produced this, this, um, these things? Um, and again, is it something I did or is it something that was in the base? Um, so both of those views are useful um, for kind of deciding what you're going to fix and how you're going to fix it um, and who's responsible for fixing it uh, for that matter too, if you've got this workflow where it's kind of split amongst different teams. Awesome. I'm going to jump back to that workflow real quick. Present. And so what we kind of did again is we, we were staying on this left-hand side of the flow. And we fixed we fixed some of our vulnerabilities, and now we're good to go. We're going to push this up in the hub, which we just did, and then any kind of mechanism that you know uh, communications that you want to do with your development team, or they're going to grab a new base. So I'm going to jump over, take off my DevOps hat, and I'm going to put on just my Dev Hop hat on, and I'm going to jump over into my application code. So this is the the target tracking. Um, and I know, uh, you know, DevOps had said, hey, we have a new base image out there for Node that everybody should start using. Please go update, right? And so I'm going to come over into my Docker file and I'm going to add in 12.18.4. And it is, was it Buster Slim? Ah, I copied the wrong thing. Um, let me get the exact. Uh, image so i don't have to type out stark industries oh it's not that one it's this node buster slim okay so now i'm going to use not just the node 12 18 4 i think it was did i get that right all right mm -hmm. um but now i'm switching to the 14 3 dash buster dash slim the image that we just fixed i'm going to use that as my base image so now i'll save that and um, not not a whole. This is as you can see. This Docker file is very base, very slim. Um, so I didn't want to didn't want to introduce too much and confuse people. It's just a very basic, slim Docker file. But I want to focus on this this uh, base image first. So I'll come into my terminal, and now that we have we updated that, I'm going to build the image. So I'm going to do a Docker build. I'm going to tag it. There's our target tracking. And let's give it 05. And let's run that build. Should be nice and fast. Okay, there we go. So now I just I've updated my, my image. I'm gonna run the scan local. Let me clear screen. So Docker uh, scan. And I'm going to tell it to uh, exclude base because I'm the developer. I don't need to care. I don't care what's in the base image. I trust my DevOps folks, right? They've they've given me. A, they said use this image. Make sure you keep all vulnerabilities out that you're going to introduce. So I'm going to focus back on just what I might have introduced. So exclude base, and I'm going to give it the file Docker file and uh, Stark in uh, technology, technologies, there we go. And mine is the target tracking. And I think I did what, 105? We'll see. <laughs> yeah, I remember. <laughs> it would've gave me an error. <laughs> okay, same thing here, 
it's uh, grabbing dependencies, gonna go out to the vulnerabilities database. And there we go. All right, Jim, what am I looking at here? Yep, so uh, in this case, you've actually got two two different sets of reports. Um, so sort of two two projects, if you will. One uh, is the code, that's the that's the piece at the bottom. So we're actually looking, we found that package JSON inside the container and did a scan on that. And, you know, there's there's one thing you could upgrade. It doesn't really introduce any vulnerabilities. We'll kind of ignore that for now. You scroll up a little bit, you've got the uh, the actual image uh, vulnerabilities. Um, and here you can see you've done a fantastic job. You're down to four vulnerabilities um, that you've you've introduced yourself uh, in here. Again, you've got the Docker file command. You know exactly where they come from um, as you were building that image. Um, and so you can see what's there. And again, you've got the sort of the dependency tree as well. You can see that these, the ones we're seeing here on screen are related to Vim. You know, if you're still, you know, this is a target here is prod. So probably we want to get rid of Vim <laughs> in our prod environments. We probably want to adjust how we build this image. Um, okay. But, you know, we could, if we, for some odd reason, need Vim in production, <laughs> we, could, <laughs> we could, I guess, look at it differently. <laughs> I guess it depends on the use case for for this particular image, but I would say no. I think now that I remember back, I was trying to fix something local, so I wanted an editor inside my my uh, container, and yeah, I should get rid of that. <laughs> so I'm gonna pull that out, save it. Let's do another build here real quick, and I'm gonna I'm gonna tick this. And like Jim mentioned earlier, you can see I have targeting prod, right? But a good, a good, uh, good highlight. Let me let me sh show real quick. So, in that scenario, I was talking about adding in a, a an editor so I can use it inside of my container. When you're developing locally, sometimes if you want to troubleshoot and you're you're trying to fix something or you just want to read something, there are various different ways you can do it. Um, so you might need an editor inside, all right? But you really shouldn't put it in your base. Here you can see I'm setting up multi-stage builds using Build Kit. And if you look at production, is based off of uh, is based off of the base, right? And so what this does is from base as prod, it's going to label this as prod. And when I did a dash dash target, that's what I'm targeting. And I'm pulling, I'm creating this final image from base. And so up here we can see I labeled this first layer, this first stage as base. So it's going to include everything that I build in here. So what I could have done is actually probably should have moved my editor down into the dev, right? Yeah. So when I build, yeah. So when I'm working locally, I'm building that, I'm targeting dev, and there, yeah, it'll put the nano in there for me and Vim. Um, but when I target dev, I'm sorry, excuse me, when I target prod, those will not be included in my image. Just wanted to highlight that real quick. The the Jim talked about it earlier. Um, doing multi-stage builds where you might want to do all of your compilations and a lot of your dev tools that you need to build an image in an earlier stage and then in a in a subsequent stage you want to pull those tools back out and just add the files that you need don't want to go too in depth uh, of that here but I definitely wanted to mention it because it plays into the security uh, vulnerabilities that you might add in your image and how you want to remove them with uh, multi-stage builds yeah okay I think go great ahead Jim. Point. Yeah, I was gonna say I think it's a great point. I think there's you know there's lots of ways to look at base images too, right? So you might use might use one of those thicker base images uh, for development, but when you get to prod, it depends on the code with M with Node. You probably wouldn't use Scratch unless you're a glutton for punishment, but maybe <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe you do. Um, uh, but there are certain ca use cases where you might use Scratch. Then you wouldn't have anything right in the container except for whatever you explicitly copy in there. Like if it was a C program or a Go program or something, that might be a great use case for having Scratch in your production container base. Right. Um, you probably still wouldn't use Scratch in your, as your development base. Um, you'd want tools and code and other things in there um, to be able to mess around with it. But yeah, great, great example. Awesome, okay. So I saved that. Let's jump over and um, build this one more time. And is that the right one? Let's go to seven because uh, those those are always our uh, we always release on odd numbers. Nope. Oh, uh, what did I do? 
talking and not paying attention. Maybe it was just that fast. <laughs> Maybe everything was already cached or something. Yeah, well, let's see. Let's do a yeah. Docker scan. Hello, geez. Target tracking 1.0.7. And let me add in um, exclude base. And I'm going to add the Docker file. Let's run the scan now. Give it a minute here. There we go. Uh oh, what did I do? Yeah, we've built something not quite right. Oops. I'm going to take this out. Oh. It, uh, oh, you know what? Those might be getting pulled. Huh. Well, that's interesting. Maybe no cash. Maybe it's using cash when it shouldn't <laughs> yeah there we go get a list of images i'm going to push that image Target tracking, 0 0.8. Yeah, another, another good example of using the those slower image there too, right? So you've got your node base image, the one we started with, which is 968 megs. Now we've got our final target tracking image that has all the node stuff built in it. And still, it's only 263 megs. So again, yeah. another reason why the vulnerabilities go down so much. Yep, um, yeah. But, it, you know, I think... One of the key points there too is a lot of times the vulnerability details can be a little overwhelming, right? Like it's in that hub view, there's a little icon off to the right. And you, if you want to get into the vulnerability details specifically, you you can, right? And that'll take you over to sneak and our vulnerability report. And then from there, you can go to CVEs and wherever you want to go, right? To distribution specific reports and on and on down those rabbit holes. But a lot of times that stuff from a development perspective is not as important. It's more more to the point, how do I get rid of these things, right? I don't really care about what Ubuntu says about this vulnerability. What I care about is, can I get it out of my container? Should I get it out of my container? Should I worry about it? Um, and I think that's really to the point of what we're what we're trying to build here is, um, is that view of, yes, all the vulnerability details are there. If you wanna get into them, you certainly can, but more to the point, how do we start getting rid of these things? Can I get a better base image? That will usually take care of a bunch of things. Um, and then, you know, being a little bit more surgical about what we add to a container and can remove from a container um, as we as we start to layer on top of that. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so you can see. Let me scroll up a little bit, get in closer in the screen. Make this bigger. Um, so here I am back in our um repository just on a general tab where I'm seeing the, the top of my scans, my latest uh, tags, sorry. And we can see here 108, now we're down to 46 high uh, severity, 13 medium, 157 low. We've gone way down from 237 based all on our, on our um, base image, right? And then we can come over here again, see the details, click on either the um, right in the tag or you can then, or you can go up into the tags tab, and then come into pick, choose your tag, and then come into vulnerabilities. But here again, you can see all the vulnerabilities. You can uh, tab through them. You can see the um, the hierarchy chain, the the dependency chain. 
but there we go. So I'm good with the 46. We removed everything out of, uh, we, we updated our base image, we removed our editors, right? And now I can push this, trigger this into my CI CD, launch it into production and feel pretty confident that uh, the severities or the vulnerabilities that are in there are not an issue, right? Yep. Awesome. Anything to add to that, Jim, before I kind of go on? Let me, I just jump back to this screen in case we want to give a little uh, color. Yeah. Again, I think, um, you know, this, it, it start, uh, you know, as you get into this, I would say the, the thing is to start with, um, with, with the higher level view, right? Base images tend to be the biggest bang for your buck. Choosing a better or slimmer base image is going to be where you can have the biggest, most dramatic effect on reducing vulnerabilities. Um, and, you know, uh, to that end, like we said before, to Docker official images are well maintained, so it's a great place to start. There may be vulnerabilities in them, but those generally you're speaking are not, they're not fixable vulnerabilities. Um, as soon as they are fixable uh, and there's a fix available, um, Docker pushes a new, a new image, right? So those things are constantly maintained as soon as there's something there to fix it. Um, but the other side of that is making them usable to a developers, right? I mean, we could remove everything we could get down you to scratch and start building, you know, building from from bare bones. Right. Um, but that's not a that's not a maintainable process for most most uh, environments, most organizations. So you got to start somewhere, and there's a bit of a trade off there. Um, right. But those, again, are those vulnerabilities actually actually dangerous in your environment and those kinds of things? That's another other set of things. But then, you know, once you get the base image, then you start looking at things that you add to the, that container and deciding okay this is for development it's okay i've introduced i've at, i've got vim and nano and, and curl and things uh when i go to production i'm not going to have those things in my container so uh, yes i see those vulnerabilities if there's something that's a particularly high severity i'll it, you know I'll, I'll rebuild and get a new version of vim uh or whatever uh, but when i go to production i'll make sure i get those removed as well so i you know start at that level um if you want to continue from there those rest of those vulnerabilities make you nervous. Um, there are ways you can go about it, right? I think, um, again, you can start looking at slimmer images, uh, even than those, and being extremely surgical about what goes in there. Um, there's loads of, of interesting projects out there that can get rid of the package managers and get rid of the shells and all those kinds of things um, from a container um, that will get rid of a lot of those vulnerabilities as well. So there's ways to get lower, but I'd say save that until you get the first patterns down. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I would agree. I think it's um, I, always, I always talk about when you're first coming to to Docker, when you're building your images, get your application running in a container first, and then start slimming down. Kind of same what Jim was just talking about with your security vulnerabilities. Start where you need, and then start slimming down, and be be um, you know strategic, and have reasons why you're removing things out of the image. Right? Sometimes it if you just started with a very slim base image or scratch and and you just find a whole bunch of problems trying to add things in you have to become a almost a a, a linux distro maintainer right if you're going from scratch it's not not fun but um yeah awesome so let me let me jump to the next slide so that's all we really have for today in a minute i'm gonna jump over to questions see if we can ask uh, answer some questions here last five minutes but like jim mentioned earlier next week is uh sneak con it's free. Please go sign up. Uh, Justin Cormack from Docker and Danielle Inbar from Sneak are going to give a talk. Check out their their talk. Uh, Justin is fantastic. Danielle is fantastic. Um, it's going to be a great talk. And then you also uh, our CEO Scott Johnson will be on. Uh, I believe in the in the keynote, or maybe that's yep. changed. But yep, yep awesome. Yep, it'll be in the keynote. Yeah. Yeah. So that's going to be great. Um, there's probably some folks that are familiar with Gareth Rushgrove. Um, he used to be at Docker as well, and he's given you know lots of talks in, in the community. He's going to be he works at Sneak, but um, he'll be doing a presentation. If you're really interested in like that whole process side of things, like okay, great, I see how you know I can use Docker to do the scanning, but what's the actual people process side of that? Um, he's got a great talk on on how to actually you know do that, and then we've got some customers um, who will be talking about their own personal you know process and what they're doing uh, with container security too so lots of great sessions there um, not just in container security but code security and, and loads of great 
speakers from all over the place. So yeah, I would love to see folks there. Again, it's free. Um, come to whatever sessions pique your interest. Awesome. Uh, so real quick, I'm just reading through the questions. Um, some folks asked, uh, you know, I did on the command line, I did a Docker space scan and it's telling me it's not, it's not a valid command. Uh, right now, the CLI is in um, on the Edge channel. So if you go to docker.com into products, download the Edge desktop, and that's where you'll see uh, Docker scan. On the Hub side, that's live right now. So if you go to uh, Hub, you can do um, you can have scanning there available right now in Hub. Um, the CLI will be will be released uh, very soon, early November, I believe November second. So stay tuned for that. Yeah, for stay. Um, so everybody. For state, yeah. Yes. All right, just reading down things here. Uh, is this available from a local hub? My company does not allow me to connect to Docker Hub. So correct me if I'm wrong, Jim. You can still, if you have the Edge version, you can still scan your images locally. Yep. Um, okay. That'll talk to to the Snake Container uh, vulnerability engine, and you mm -hmm. can do that locally, right, on the command line. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's definitely ways we can support, um, you know, that. So the you absolutely you can do, use Docker Desktop no matter what, um, and do and do your scans locally. Um, but we can set up sneak as well to scan you know it doesn't really make a difference what registry you use we can we can set up those scans and produce uh, very similar uh, types of information um, that you would see in in hub just directly yep. from sneak yep. and randy you should uh talk to your management chain and have them uh, give you access to hub <laughs> <laughs> there you go <laughs> okay let, let's take we probably take one more quick one here um, okay, this is from Kent. Thanks, Kent. Uh, let me move my microphone. When uh, Sneak scans the container that was built from a base, if the base image ignored a scan result because they felt it was unnecessary to fix, will it show up in the scan uh, of the image, which is base plus application code? Yeah. 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 Yes, yes, it will. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, so there's yeah, there's there's some really interesting. This is really kind of a, to the heart of what Gareth's talk is going to be next week at Sneakon. Is this idea of this multi-team workflow, and not just like we talked about excluding base image vaults, which is w one way of ignoring them, I guess. But you can also use actual ignores. Like with vulnerabilities, you have an ignore, and you put in a reason why you're ignoring them, and it gets audited. All those kinds of things, right? Um, so that's that could be part of your workflow as well. Um, but the, I think to that question specifically, you know, if one team decides to ignore and you're just sort of inheriting what they do, can you pick up that ignore automatically as well? And there are ways to do that. So I would highly encourage you um, to, again, just, just register for, register for SneakCon. Gareth's talk is on uh, the, the second day. I can't remember. I don't know my days of the weeks anymore, but it's either Tuesday or Wednesday, I think, of next week. But you'll find the schedule there. Just go to that link and you'll find the schedule. Gareth Rushgrove is, um, is giving that talk patterns for secure base image management um, and he will address that question very specifically um, and, and you know any kind of workflow you, you can sort of dream up yeah 100 percent gareth gareth's uh brilliant sure it's gonna be a great talk yeah cool well i think that's it um but yes mark lee uh don't add nano and vim into your images either Thank you. Uh, sometimes, sometimes when you're doing demonstrations, you have to do uh, some some stupid stuff to um, to to uh, sh show show demonstrate things. But great, I, how often those those end up in images? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and and I shouldn't say stupid. I, I I shouldn't say that. I didn't mean that, right? As you go further along in your uh, containerization journey, right, you you understand those a little bit more and, and understand how images and containers work, but. Um, so sorry if I offended anybody, if you have Vim or uh, Nano in your images, I did not mean to, but <laughs> awesome. Well, I really, really appreciate everybody joining. Um, the, shortly after this, uh, you should get an email with a replay link in case uh, you didn't get to see all of it. I think uh, some folks were mentioning they came in a little bit late, no problem. You'll get a link to the replay. Um, again, go to SneakCon, sign up, uh, check out all of the, the talks. 
you can also go to um let me put it into the chat right here hopefully it doesn't take out my url so yeah please go check out our public roadmap uh that is docker's roadmap we do use that the pms are in there all the time um we do that is what we are currently working on and so if you have any new features you'd like to add in please put them in there and uh you know thumbs up the other features that you see in there but again thank you so much jim any uh last parting words no yeah i think um you know put put put, put you want what you want to see in that in the docker roadmap uh, both teams are working on uh you know the next phases of, of integration and what we can do so really exciting really excited about uh, that ongoing work but of course it's all based on what people want to see and do so uh, so make sure you let us know awesome all right everybody thanks so much we'll talk to you and see you on the next uh, webinar have a great day Thanks.